Oh, good morning and welcome to the 14th annual Canadian Fertilizer Products Forum. My name is Suzanne Beattie from Premier Tech and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Fertilizer Canada Products Committee and I will be your host and moderator today. Um, before we get started, uh, since it is not ever too far away from our thoughts, I have a message for you with regards to COVID-19. We will be ending a little bit early today because most people across Canada should be expecting an interruption from um, by an emergency public alert that's going to be broadcast on television, radio, and sent to mobile device devices as part of a countrywide test of the system. So we will uh, try to end the session at 12.45. So we just wanted to let everyone know why we are ending early and also a bit of a heads up that you should be expecting that emergency alert as well. Fertilizer Canada, now back to our, our session. Um, Fertilizer Canada, and in partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Fertilizer and Supplements Advisory Committee, hosts this event every year to help ensure that fertilizers and supplements in Canada are globally competitive and that growers have access to new products in a timely manner. And normally, we hold this uh, forum in Ottawa, but uh, under the, uh, the current situation, this is our first event that we've held um, virtually. Um, and. Uh, uh, the sessions I think up till now have been very successful and very well attended and um, the feedback has been good. So I'm hoping that uh, as this is our last presentation keynote with our keynote speakers that um, you find it equally um, informative and I'm sure you will. And um, I will start to introduce our, our next first speakers. Uh, we're excited to have presentations from Mark Cullen and Ben Cullen um, from Gardening Trends, and they will be presenting on Gardening Trends during COVID-19, fast forward 10 years. Frankly, Frankie Flowers, also known in his, uh, in his other life as Frankie or Frank Farajean, and he will present on Canada's new gardeners and what they know about fertilizer. And finally, we will have Carrie Lee Birchall uh, speaking about soil superheroes. Throughout the session, our chat box will be available to you for uh, participants uh, to submit questions. And after the presentations, I will read those questions to our speakers and they will provide answers to you. The session today will be recorded and sent out to all of you who have joined today. We wanna thank you all for joining us today for our last CFPF session and uh, a very special thank you to our keynote speakers. To begin our session, I would like to hand over to Mark Cullen and Ben Cullen. Mark has been broadcasting and writing about the gardening experience since the early 1980s. And he has written 23 books, including two biographies. Escape to Reality is Mark's 24th book. And he says, this is the most exciting book that I have ever written as it reflects the experience and passion for Canada's most popular outdoor leisure time activity of two generations, mine and Sun Ben's. In 2016, Ben, or rather Mark, was awarded the Order of Canada for his connection with everyday Canadians through his gardening and environmental messages. He is also a volunteer chair of the Highway of Heroes Tree Campaign and Trees for Life, Trees for Heroes. And uh, we will prov be providing a link to that campaign uh, so you can learn a little bit more about it. Um, so a video will be included uh, with uh, the presentations that will be sent out to you. And I hope you have a chance to take a look at that. Escape to Reality is Mark's second non-how-to gardening book. Mark and Ben provide a well-informed and deeply personal reflection on the state of gardening today, a look into their crystal ball and an explanation of why this is the most exciting time in the history of Canada to be a gardener. Ben, is a fourth generation gardener. He is a graduated and graduate of the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus and is a, has a Bachelor of Commerce from Dalhousie in Halifax. Ben spent several years working in the food industry before traveling across Europe, Russia, Mongolia, and China on his own, and then joined Mark in the business two years ago. Ben, like many millennials, has a passion for food gardening and the environment. Ben is a founder and owner of Cullen's Foods, a specializing in organic Canadian grown pulses. He is married to Sam and enjoys leisure time with his dog Ruby when he is not gardening in his 2000 square foot allotment garden in Guelph, Ontario. Escape to Reality is Ben's first published book and but likely not his last. And so now I'll pass 
uh, the screen over to Ben and Mark. Thank you, oh, Susan. Thank you for that intro. That was great. Hey, Ben, I have a question. What's your question? My question is, watching Suzanne, listening to Suzanne introduce us here, I noticed the official photo photograph that you sent in for the fertilizer people. You haven't shaved. Can you afford a razor or what's the problem here with you millennials? <laughs> you never seem to shave. Well, I don't you know, get this millennial I, thing. People know that I'm the young guy and I, I want them to know I can, I, I can put on facial hair when I have to. Oh, um, I see. I don't know. Maybe it's just it's just the sort of the look now. I've just been going with it. <laughs> I think it's very much a look. And you know, it's a good place to start because, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this inter you know, this 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 opportunity. We appreciate it to be able to talk about our great passion about gardening and about organics and about sustainability. Uh, and we we promise to give you the best we've got. Now I hope that that you find that useful. Um, Ben and I have a lot of thoughts that we want to share, including some of the thoughts that are the basis, the foundation of Escape to Reality. Why, uh, how, how um, gardening is changing Canadians and how society is changing gardening. The experience has been sped up through COVID and we'll get, we'll get into that as we wade into Escape to Reality. So uh, Ben, uh, I don't know if you shaved this morning, it's looking to me like you might not have um, <laughs> and that's, a millennial, that's the millennial for you. So there's a gap. We'll be talking a little bit about that gap. And Ben, why don't you kick us off? All right. So um, where are we at? We're in 2020. And what's dominated 2020? COVID-19. We can't talk about 2020 without at least acknowledging um, that big, germy elephant in the room. And um, I think... Scott Galloway puts it best. Scott Galloway is a marketing professor at New York University. Um, interesting guy to follow. And basically he says, things won't change as much as they will accelerate while other crises reshape the future. COVID-19 is just making the future happen faster. And I tend to agree because a lot of the trends that we've seen um, pick up in 2020 were pre-existing trends, weren't they, Dad? Well, that's right. And uh, the point I think uh, you and I would like to make at this stage before we wade into escape to reality, Ben is going to give us a bit of an overview on trends, is to realize that we actually wrote escape to reality before COVID, before there was any notion that COVID might even occur. And here we are at a time when many of the trends that we talk about, and frankly, Frankie Flowers is going to talk about as he follows us here, uh, are trends that have sped up probably by about 10 years uh, since March, right? That's right, that's exactly right. Because even if we were to go back to 2019, let's look at some of these things. House plants were growing in popularity, vegetable growing and organics were growing in popularity. There was a movement away from lawns. We were starting to talk about soil health and the online, the shift to online retailing is really important because it's where people are getting so much of their information. So um, mm -hmm. Frankie has some more data on this. We did compare notes. We don't want to repeat each other too much. Frankie's got some really interesting data on this. But top line, 10,000 foot view, these are the, the broad based trends and um, with only one exception. And the only exception to the pre-existing trends that have been accelerated has been this re-suburbanization of real estate. So people fleeing the cities where there had been this kind of prolonged migration into the cities, smaller homes, just in a snap, people have been heading back out, packing their bags back out to the suburbs, smaller cities, rural areas. Uh, and what does that mean? That means backyards. That means outdoor time. That means gardening, right? So that's the only exception, but it still contributes to the broad based trend towards gardening. So um, anything to add to that, Dad? No, I think you're right on track. Okay, so we've got house plants, and you know this has been playing out for a while. Daryl Cheng is a, a good friend of ours, another garden communicator. He's out there on Instagram with over half a million followers, um, showing how to grow house plants. So all of these, and it's a really interesting target market because it's people who often are closer to my age who have zero experience growing anything but a lot of enthusiasm. And a lot of myths pervade um, because it, in the online space where a lot of the education is happening, uh, there's a lot of conflicting messages. 
the other day I was in a, I was on a online, I was on a Facebook group for gardeners and uh, somebody made the point that you can grow house plants without fertilizer. This is not true, right? Because most of these container growing is basically sterile. So there's, there's definitely an education gap there, uh, but the enthusiasm is strong and um, that is a really powerful thing. So we're, we're really enjoying watching that play out. And of course, people spending more time at home than ever. Well, what a great time to take in some house plants. Hmm. Right? And we all need some company. We all need some company. I mean, you got right. a dog, but not every, not, not every not millennial dog. living not in a 500 has a, foot. Has a dog at their yeah. side all day, every day. So that's a trend that we've seen. Um, Certainly, and I think an opportunity for the industry where education is concerned, because growing house plants uh, cannot be done very successfully without some type of fertilizer. Um, and then this is where there's sort of like a broad based understanding. And Frankie, if you're watching this, I promise this is the only tiny overlap you're going to see between us and you. But um, this is an interesting study out of Dalhousie University, my alma mater. And um, so then Charlebois has written about in Canadian Grocer magazine. So 17.4% of Canadians, so almost one fifth of Canadians started growing food during the pandemic. That's pretty amazing. And we're inclined to recall, you know, the victory gardens that helped win the war, uh, food sovereignty and so forth. But the flip side of that, and that's why I have a position this way, is really only less than 2% of Canadians actually grow everything they need, eat. So as Sylvan puts it, you know, I wouldn't lose any sleep if I were a grocer, um, but what, what that tells us is there's a lot of room for growth. We've never seen people gardening this way before, or at least we haven't seen since the victory gardens of the Great War, but also there's a lot of room for people to do more, right? There's a lot of growth opportunity. There's still a lot of lawn that has yet to be converted. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I look at this. Uh, Dad, how do, you, how do you view that trend? No, absolutely right on. Um... Food. We're going to talk a little bit more about food gardening because there's more to it when you start to drill down than meets the eye. And there why is. don't you talk about the hipsteader, which was a new term for me. This is, uh, this is adding to dad's lexicon. So it's been a really interesting thing to watch it play out because, yes, it's true. Less than 2% of Can Canadians are growing their own food. But what we've seen happening, and again, this was something... There's all of these converging factors. It's so fascinating to watch where people are growing more at home. There's always going to be the hyper-passionate individuals within any hobby group. And um, certainly what we're seeing now is they call them hipsteaders. And typically they're more stylish and health and environmentally conscious than your traditional rubber boots, backyard veggie grower. Uh, often they sell to the public. Often they're at farmer's markets and we're seeing more of these small scale veggie growers take hold and they have incredible um, social media savvy for marketing what they produce and you can kind of look at them in two ways where they're either very small farmers or they're very large gardeners and I think as a marketing opportunity um, they probably have some unmet needs that fall in between right because they're buying a lot more fertilizer as individuals than uh, a home gardener would be but most of the agricultural products that are available to them uh, are not appropriate. And so I think there is a certain gap in the market as we see more and more of these one third of an acre to two acre type growers come online and either uh, as a movement towards self-sufficiency or towards sort of the market gardening, farmer's market kind of trend that's been playing out. And so that's something that's been driving this as well as Canadians become more insecure about food, they're forging more of these relationships directly with growers. So it is an interesting thing to watch perpetuate. Uh, lots of trends supporting it and um, definitely something to have on your radar uh, as a fertilizer company or as somebody who, who, who works sort of in the field. So we've had um, a, a fun time watching that. And again, if you're on social media, there's some great ones. One that's local to dad is Maker's Acre. I think they're two and a half acres outside Stouffville. And they're making a go of it. They're selling vegetables at the farmer's market every weekend through the season. So uh, the mainstream conversation, this is really interesting as well. Kiss the ground, nature's best hope, hidden life of trees. These are all like big hits. We're not talking garden geeks sharing amongst themselves. 
we're talking New York Times bestsellers, right? And um, some of the messaging here is really interesting. Dad, why don't you explain sort of how Kiss the Ground, you know, with soil and carbon and the biodiversity message in uh, Doug Tallamy's book, can you explain how some of that comes together around sort of an emerging public consciousness? Well, first of all, to be clear, Kiss the Ground is a movie. And if you get Netflix, which it seems a lot of Canadians are watching a lot of Netflix right now, uh, you can tune in tonight after you've finished uh, The Crown and you can watch Kiss the Ground. It's about an hour and a half. It's a fabulous movie and it will, it will open your eyes and you may not agree with every word that's spoken there, but it's uh, narrated by Woody Harrelson and he does a great job. Kiss the Ground uh, is, is important, I think, for all of us who are on this call this morning uh, because as people in the horticultural business and with connections to Canadian horticulture one way or the other, we see a message that is being embraced by many, many people. This is not, this is a hit. This is a huge hit. And I don't know how many people I've asked the question, have you seen Kiss the Ground? And they've said, yes, I have. Isn't it amazing? Uh, it's not anti-fertilizer. It is to some degree perhaps anti-chemical. And I think um, people at Monsanto would not view the producers of this, uh, this film as their friends, but it is very revealing from the point of view that it boils down a very complicated message about the importance of our soil, the importance of preserving our soil, the importance of enhancing our soil. And it begins with a lot of bad news. For instance, we've lost 30% of our topsoil worldwide in agricultural areas since 1970, 30% since 1970, and a prediction that by the year 2100, so that's 80 years from now, uh, no soil, no soil will exist, uh, virtually no soil on uh, uh, agricultural land if we keep going the way we're going. So the message becomes one of sustainability. And if you just kind of hang on that word when you turn this on, then let it take you for a ride and see what, and, and judge for yourself what you think about the message here. We think it's very powerful. Now, the second image here, Nature's Best Hope, is a book. It's uh, also it's on the New York Times bestsellers list, as Ben mentioned. It's a fairly current book written only about a year ago by Douglas Talami. Now, this is an amazing book that talks to North Americans about a backyard national park, about how everything that we do on our condo balconies, in our yards, impacts on the greater, greener world, the natural world. And um, I'd love to go on about this, Ben, but we don't have enough time, other than to suggest that everybody on this call this morning should read this if you're interested in the future of gardening, not just in Canada, because we are not in a bubble in that respect. We live next door to the Americans who are also very much on the same path as us with regards to how do we view the gardening experience? How do we view the gardening experience in a year, two years, five years from now? Read Nature's Best Hope. And then The Hidden Life of Trees, of course, this is old news. I don't need to go on about it. But this book was published about five years ago. It was on the New York Times bestsellers list for over a year. Now think about that. A book about trees on the New York Times bestsellers list for over a year. What's that all about? It's about opening the eyes of everybody that read this to an entirely different world from what we imagined uh, where trees are concerned. He talks about forests, but he also talks about street kids. Street kids are trees in the urban environment. And Ben and I have developed a tremendous passion for building trees or rather planting trees and maintaining uh, trees in the urban environment. And this book is a game changer. Brought together, these three, these, these two books in this film, brought together, bring me to something really, I think, very impactful for all of us. And that is the general understanding as Canadians become more enthusiastic about gardening, as they inform themselves to a greater degree than they ever have before about the gardening experience, about the interconnectedness of what we do relative to the world we live in. It's not just about us. 
it's not just about human beings and how we benefit from the experience in the soil or by growing trees or by taking a walk in the forest. It's about the entire world, the natural world of which we are a part. And so I think, and I'll finish here, Ben, and let you pick it up. I think there is a dawning right now in Canada among consumers that we are not alone. Think about that, that we are not alone, that we are a part of the natural world. We always were, but since the second world war, we've been told it's all about us. And that is in reverse. That is in high speed reverse. And here we are. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, and I, and I agree there. And I think um, the two major, like the sort of the banner issues, the headline issues that this deals with, really is, uh, you know, in environmental circles, they're calling them the dual crises of uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. And uh, certainly Kiss the Ground deals with the climate carbon sequestration issue sort of head on. And uh, Nature's Best Hope really deals with the direct connection between how we garden and how we support biodiversity in our environment. So that's, we definitely see that entering the consciousness uh, of, of growers. and. My final point here about trends is we're pulling everything forward a decade. And this everybody knows that online shopping is not new. Everybody knows that online shopping has accelerated massively throughout this. And uh, that means Amazon, yes. It also means seed catalogs. And I mean, if it, it, we anybody in the industry who's talked to the seed companies knows what kind of a year they had filling orders. Uh, to support all these people who are at home wanting to grow food and they want to deliver it to their door. Um, and we think we're going to see more of this. And when you're talking products, and again, with respect to who we're speaking to, we're speaking to fertilizer producers, be mindful of this shift. And I see it twofold. One, um, there's a lot of confusion about there, out there about what products do I need? And two, does your product work in a format that can be delivered? Is it water soluble? Is it, is it marketed by the kind of remote uh, seed catalog types and also love them or hate them, Amazon, those types of places. We're gonna see, I think a lot of growth and demand by way of those channels. So uh, just be mindful of that. And that's sort of, that's sort of a, a brief summary of the trends. Escape to reality is where we were going into this. And like I said, we, we've seen a lot of this accelerate, but this was how we articulated it in our book. Um, and actually, if I can just back up for a minute here, speaking of our book, Nature's Best Hope, Doug was telling me we did have the opportunity to have him on our podcast, um, which is called Green File. You can find that on Apple or Spotify. We had a really good conversation with Doug telling me if you want to learn more about that. Fascinating, kind of fascinating man. Very yeah. deep, very well studied on this subject. He is. And he Green really file. spells out the explicit relationship between what we yeah. plant and the biodiversity that can support. So from... Um, Escape to reality, we talk about embracing nature. So this is something we've seen uh, over the years. And what we can learn to the, from the British is a chapter in the book. We look to the British as sort of thought leaders on this subject, don't we, Dad? Right. Uh, and, and, and we mentioned this because very few great ideas are, are hatched without borrowing from somebody. And uh, if you want to, in my opinion, look at the leading trends in gardening as they appear in Canada at some point, go to Britain because their passion for gardening is, is roughly equal to the passion we have in Canada for hockey, although maybe less so now, seeing as there's no NHL. But my point, of course, my analogy is you know, an important one because people in Canada that have not been to the UK or have not exposed themselves to the enthusiasm and the depth of knowledge uh, the, 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 the Brits have for uh, horticulture uh, are missing something. And each of us, I see there's 92 of us now on this call. I, I can't imagine anybody watching this Zoom call and participating in this Zoom call that wouldn't want to 
join the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, which I understand is one of the wealthiest not-for-profits charities in the UK. It's all about horticulture. Their annual budget is up in the 80 million pound range, which is like $150 million. It's huge. And that is merely an illustration of the passion that the Brits have for gardening and the pedigree that goes back about 500 years. So that's why Ben and I don't devote a, a chapter in Escape to Reality to what we can learn from the British? And the answer is plenty. That's right. And so, um, I mean, this just goes to show you the level of sophistication with food growing. I mean, it's really, it's really at the level of talking about art and science intersecting, if that's what you want to look at. But back to the convergence of climate change and biodiversity kind of coming together, where does this manifest in the consumer trends Certainly one thing that we think we're gonna see more of is conversation around peat because it's a very active conversation in the UK. And I know that peat is sort of an adjacent industry to fertilizer. However, we've seen um, in our, our explorations of the UK, I have a sister who lives in London, so we get to go there pretty frequently. Uh, at Chelsea Flower Show, you see more and more peat substitutes. You see a social movement a social shaming of gardeners who are using peat and a lot of experimentation around alternate growing mediums, which of course, there's nothing quite like peat. That's why it's so popular. But if you're looking down the pipeline at where the, where the consumer might be going, certainly we think there's an opportunity to get out ahead of it by investing in um, really uh, viable peat alternatives. And this is one that we've seen uh, where they're composting wool uh, it's an interesting product, very expensive. It was 18 British pounds per bag when I saw it at Chelsea. Um, but again, there will be demand, we think, in this space because that's certainly where all the trends are headed. And um, we think that's very interesting. So bringing on the critters, this is about how the style of gardening has changed. People want to bring wildlife into their yards more than ever. In, in, in perfect tandem, with the growing interest in veggie gardening, we've seen growing interest in birding. We had um, Jordi Allaire of Birds Canada on our podcast recently as well. They've been seeing the exact same thing because people are at home, they're curious about their surroundings and um, certainly gardens serve as a bit of a portal into the wild. So um, dad, how would you, what would you add to gardening for the critters? Well, what, what I would add is that when Ben and I were contemplating how the gardening experience has changed for our book, Escape to Reality, we, we thought about the question, what is a gardener? What is a Canadian gardener? And the answer is a little bit complicated, but it doesn't need to be. It's just multifaceted. A gardener is a birder. A gardener is a hiker. A gardener is a person with an appreciation for nature, for trees. Uh, a gardener is physically active and a gardener is very social. But above all, a gardener is a person who appreciates nature and the role of nature in the gardening experience. So after the Second World War, there was this idea that was fostered in my father's generation, which was a gardener is someone who controls nature. That's changing. Unless you're over 60, it's changing dramatically. And there's no millennial out there that would say gardening is really about controlling mother nature. Gardening has become a partnership with nature. And so birding and all of the sort of ancillary activities and business that's connected to birding becomes part of that and part of how we define ourselves as gardeners. What's the next slide, Ben? I'll just, I'll just finish up on, okay, I thought it was the insect hotel. I guess we'll get to that. Okay. Well, 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 yeah, stick with your, stick with your plan. <laughs> and okay. we'll, we'll get to the insect plan. We'll get to the insect hotel. I have something to say when we get there. Well, we might've, we might've actually taken that out in the interest of time. The insect oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Here's an interesting thing. Reflect once again on the experience of the British in the garden. When you go to a garden center or the gift shop at Kew Gardens or Wisley Gardens, you'll notice that there are almost as many insect related products as there are bird related products. There are a lot of insect hotels, mason bee houses, habitat for mason bees. 
um, et cetera. And all of this springs from a basic understanding that 99.9% .9 of the bugs in the garden are good. They're beneficial. So what we talk about in Escape to Reality is the demonization of many of the things that we've learned to hate over generations is also beginning to move in reverse very quickly. Can't move quickly enough for me. I'll name a few. Toads, bats, spiders, snakes. We talk about how all of those things are, they have very important, essential roles in the, in the, in the natural web, uh, which we are a part of. And that's all I'll say about that for now. Great. And, um, you know, we've talked quite a bit about food throughout this presentation. In our book, we talk quite a bit specifically about sort of the, demo, the de democratization of food in community food centers, uh, which is a really interesting concept, but also in community gardens, which uh, in most municipalities are oversubscribed because there is just such an appetite for this. And again, the one exception to pre-existing trends accelerating is suburbanization, but it, with the urbanization that led up to COVID and which I think will continue again uh, when this is over, but that's just a personal projection. Um, there is a demand for freeing up public space uh, for this type of activity as well. So um, anyway, with that, to think like a plant, that's sort of our mentality as we approach this subject. And um, you know, certainly that type of thinking and narrative works when you're talking about fertilizer, which is food for plants. Um, it's definitely a need. And um, uh, I think we, just in the interest of time, we'll finish up here with Highway of Heroes and our gratitude to the Fertilizer Products Group, uh, your members, this organization and event for supporting the Highway of Heroes campaign, which Dad, you maybe, I think you're better equipped to update folks on what that's about. Well, I have no doubt that there are people that have joined us today that have supported the Highway of Heroes tree campaign. We launched seven years ago with the goal to plant 117,000 trees on Canada's original Highway of Heroes. So named because 158 Canadians lost during the Afg Afghan conflict were driven by hearse from CFB Trenton, 170 kilometers to the coroner's office at Keel Street in the 401. 117,000 trees right on the right of way of the 401 or Highway of Heroes. We have a contract with the MTO, Ministry of Transportation, to do this. And the number 117,000, first of all, fits on the highway quite nicely. And secondly, that's the number of Canadians that we have lost at war since the uh, War of 1812. We're planting another 1.8 million trees on the other side of the right of way, on the corridor of the 401, all the way from the Quebec border down to Windsor. And that number came from the number of Canadians who have volunteered for military service during times of war since 1812. The Highway of Heroes tree campaign uh, is primarily a, a, a living memorial to those who have served, those who volunteered to serve, those who continue to serve, and of course, to those that were lost uh, through, our, through war uh, in our Canadian military. It's a $10 million campaign. We've raised $9.5 million, I almost said already. It's not already, it's been an awful lot of work, but you know, we've got as far as we have been because over 4,500 Canadian donors, Canadians have stepped to the plate and donated $150 buys you a tree. And right now during the Black Friday situation, um, it's not Black Friday, sorry, Giving Tuesday, Giving Tuesday, which is next Tuesday, the 1st of December, uh, you're any, you give a dollar, a dollar is matched. We have a private Canadian donor who is matching all donations at the moment. And if you'd like to learn more, H-O-H tribute.ca is our uh, is our uh, website. And Ben, um, last thing I'll say is I believe somebody will fill us in on the details of this. We have a little four minute video that we would like you to see. And uh, either you can click on and see it later, or I don't know if we're going to do that between now and when we conclude this morning. I'm not sure, but also uh, should be said of those 4,500, thanks to Frankie Flowers, 
who uh, supported Highway of Heroes with today. Absolutely. Uh, yes, he's been a huge supporter, huge supporter. Thank you, Frankie, and thank you to all of the people that have joined us today who have already signed up, shown up for public tree planting or made or made a contribution to the Highway of Heroes tree campaign. Uh, ben, this is a great way for people to keep in touch. Um, uh, I, I want to suggest that uh, if, if the kind of work that we do interests you, uh, based on what you've heard this morning, then go to markcullen.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter. You'll see the real Ben and the real Mark. You'll see us having fun. You'll see a little bit of humor. You'll hear our stories and you'll receive free once a month only. We promise not to overburden your inbox this time of year once a month. And then in April through November, we publish in the middle of the month as well, uh, a food related gardening newsletter as well. So thanks so much. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And Suzanne, we'll see uh, where you'd like to take the conversation from here. Well, oh, thanks very much, Mark and Ben. That was, I was taking so many notes here myself uh, um, about uh, all the things you said. I know I'm going to have to go back through the recording and pick <laughs> up a few more things as well. But um, uh, there were a few things I just wanted to mention because I'm sure there's other people that go, oh, I'm going to have to run back that recording to hear the name of that podcast and I just wanted it was called The Green File. So well, that's uh, Mark and Ben's podcast. And um, I'll, I'm going to add uh, Kiss the Ground to my Netflix list and maybe I'll put it a little closer to the top than some of the other ones that I've had recommended. Um, and I have to confess, I haven't seen The Crown yet. So maybe I'll even move this. Oh one. boy, there's a tough decision. <laughs> the Crown <laughs> is a tough confession to make. But. Uh, Suzanne, um, could I add one other thing too? Yes. Um, David and Attenborough's most recent um, uh, uh, video movie, it's called A Life on Our Planet, is stunning and it's very impactful. And if you even turn the sound off, you'd be blown away just by the photography in David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, an hour and a half of your time, extremely well invested. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, and just wanted to mention a couple other things you were talking about. Of course, we've got uh, millennials interested here, and we do have some different perspectives with regards to uh, synthetic chemistry and its role in uh, sustainability and agriculture. And I think I just wanted to leave everybody here on the call with the message that it's not just um, we need to listen, and the listening is a two-way street. Um, so we um, there's a role for um, both um, in our in our uh, striving to for sustainability and uh, just exactly how some of our current practices also um, can be used or to benefit things or uh, sustainability and also climate change as well. Um, I just wanted to mention too that I've got a daughter, she's a 20 something and this was her first year of having a garden. She uh, headed out to the country um, again because of COVID and uh, she and her roommate started their first garden and uh, uh, yeah, they had a lot of questions. Uh, just uh, what kind of soil do we fill this great big box garden with? Because it was 10 by 14 and we went through a few of those things and I was certainly interested in the plant selection they chose. They had a few plants that apparently were chosen for friends. So um, anyway, um, you know, it's, it is a great opportunity for us all to get together and, and look at how gardening and the re related opportunities here um, affect our lives. I think this is a great time during COVID. It's one of the positives, at least, that we get a chance to reflect on what makes our lives better. Um, now, I just wanted to uh, take the questions, if we have some questions from our participants, and, um, and then we will move on after that to Frankie. We see two questions here. Ben, yes. do you see them on the bottom of your screen at Q&A? Yeah, I can, read out the, I can read out the question and then if you guys can decide, you're good at the back and forth there and see how you'd like to respond to those. Great. Um, the first question is from Jeff Crampton. Uh, given the rise of the hipster, so there you go. We've already got someone using hipster grower and uh, they are on small acreage, one third to one acre growers. Can we learn something from the farming communities in India? From a scalability perspective, there are likely many parallels. You or me, Ben? Well, I have a thought on it, but Dad, you want to lead or? Well, um, I mean, the answer I think is no doubt. We, we could learn a lot, um, but Ben, I think we should talk about some of the experience that we've had in Detroit. So it's important, I think, to reflect on a, international experiences with urban gardening uh, or urban farming, if you like, um, 
uh, that are translatable, that we can, you know, move into Canada and use. And when we look at what's happening in Detroit, Ben, you joined me on a drive down there to do an interview uh, with the people who founded Recovery Park. We discovered a story that is extremely interesting and, and could be useful to any Canadian gardening in a public urban space. What do you think? Um, I think that for, for certain. And I also think... Uh, it's sort of yes and no. I think the scalability, yes. I think the ways that small scale farmers market their crops in places like India or Central America uh, can be paralleled. There's interesting stories about how Indian farmers have started marketing their crops using cell phones, communicating directly with the markets um, in the bigger cities. Really interesting how they're out ahead of us in terms of that, right? Because I don't know of any small scale growers who are communicating with farmers markets in the city that way. Um, but also um, something we have here is quite an advanced agricultural extension um, apparatus and we have really good universities and understanding of soil health and so forth. And what we've seen in some of our work, you know, we've also worked with a not-for-profit in Central and South America called SHARE, which is by Canadian farmers for South and Central American farmers. And um, oftentimes they're also lagging behind when it comes to things like soil health. There's a lot of excess tillage in some of the ways that they're farming in places like India and, and Central America or elsewhere. So um, the scale and marketing lessons to be learned absolutely, but from a uh, sort of uh, global development, international development standpoint, uh, we are very advanced here as well. And I think there's actually sharing opportunities going the other way uh, too. So that's my thought on that. Thanks. Thanks, Ben and Mark. Um, second question we have is from Clyde, and I think this is a reference to you saying we were looking to Britain and probably some references to Victory Gardens. Um, are we going to see a return to potatoes and cabbages grown in front yards? <laughs> so are we, I guess the, the other question that is, uh, is the lawn the, the future of front yards? You know, we've talked today a little bit about how time is in some, some respects moving in reverse. Cabbage Town in Toronto was so named because people grew cabbages in their front yard during the Depression. Um, this is the, the east side of central Toronto. Uh, for those of you familiar with the city of Toronto, you should go back to Cabbage Town because they are growing cabbage there again, and they are growing potatoes there again. And um, I think the answer is yes. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, and there's some interesting um, social movements that have names which are actively promoting this. And one is food up front, the other is food not lawns. And those are two uh, community activist movements within Toronto to encourage people to convert their lawns to food. Um, and often with the intention that they just be shared. That, you know, there's often there's signage that you can get, there's seeds that's provided, resources, teaching, so that you can convert your lawn to food and make it available to people in the community who want it. Will it ever be mainstream? Perhaps not. But certainly within certain urban enclaves, we're seeing a lot more of this type of thing, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in, interest, in the interest of time, and I, I uh, you know, given also that we mentioned that we're gonna to have to end a little bit earlier, um, we'll move on to Frankie Flowers. Frankie Farragine, also known as Frankie Flowers, is arguably Canada's most popular. Oh, well, maybe the two people before him may have argued that too. Most popular, most trusted garden <laughs> expert and weatherman. <laughs> he is known for his ability to combine practical gardening advice with humor, loves to share his passions for everything outdoors with the world. Frankie's garden advice has twice earned him the Landscape Ontario Gardens Communicator of the Year, and he has been named Toronto's favorite weather personality eight years consecutively. Um, that's in the Toronto Sun Readers Awards. And his Disney-inspired Tinkerbell Garden won three awards, including Public Choice and Best Overall Gardens at Canada Blooms. Frankie is a four-time best-selling author. He's a consultant, a garden writer, social media, media strategist, philanthropist, and probably his favorite role is as a father of two boys, Gavin and Matheson. I, maybe they're even listening, Frankie. <laughs> Frankie's family runs one of the largest combined greenhouse garden center operations in Canada uh, called uh, at uh, Bradford Greenhouses. Uh, Frankie believes that life should be fun and lives every day by the mantra, if you are green, you are growing. So I'll pass this over to Frankie. Welcome, hey. Frankie. 
Hey, Suzanne, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me today as well. I want to give a big shout out as well to, uh, to Ben and Mark. Uh, and just truth be told, Mark Cullen is somebody who inspired me to get out there to motivate people in terms of gardening overall. So Mark, thank you for that. And it's nice to see Ben along the way. If you're wondering, if you see me petting away here, I, I just got my coworker in my lap. That's my little dog, Bentley, that's there. Um, Great to be here today. Uh, for everybody out there, I'm just gonna share my screen right now and get myself rolling here and tell you what's gonna go on in terms of what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. And that is about 2020, uh, the year of Canada's new gardener. So a little bit about uh, myself as well on top of what you just heard there. And it's always uncomfortable, by the way, when somebody gives you an intro. I don't know why I always feel uncomfortable when people talk about me. Um, I, I spend each and every morning on breakfast television and on breakfast television, uh, we talk a lot about many different things. And at the beginning of the pandemic that happened, when we started broadcasting, I started broadcasting live from my family greenhouse in Bradford, Ontario. This week, I returned back to that family greenhouse now that Toronto is underneath the lockdown. But I can profoundly remember, uh, remember back to uh, March when we thought to ourselves, what's gonna happen with the garden season this year? That's something that I spoke to with my parents and my uncles and my aunts. And we were really worried at that time because we were worried about a shutdown. We saw what happened with Easter and we were wondered, will people garden this year? And, and with that overall, what happened was people did garden and people gardened uh, more so than ever before. And gardening became cool. I wanna also speak about what's happened in the last few years as well. Gardening has also increased its coolness because cannabis became legal. So a lot of younger people would venture in and start to uh, experiment. And I would say that cannabis was one of uh, gardening's greatest gateways uh, where people maybe would grow some cannabis and then thereafter pop into some tomatoes and some peppers and things like that and really start to enjoy the garden overall. So who is Canada's new gardener? Well, as we already heard with Ben and uh, Mark's presentation that almost one in five Canadians have tried gardening amid the pandemic. Uh, and that's from the University of Dalhousie. And, and most of them are really starting off and venturing into the world of gardening by trying to grow food for the first time. I love that people are trying to grow food because to me, it's about valuing food. I grew up in the Hall of Marsh as well. And at the Hall of Marsh, uh, as a kid, I grew up growing lettuce and romaine, carrots and onions. And I really knew the type of work it took to grow a bag of carrots. And I, I really enjoy that people are doing this not only to get the experience, to feel proud about themselves, but at the same token, to value food. If we can get them to value food, they'll maybe value farming, value agriculture, and actually support agriculture at a greater list, at a greater, at a greater uh, amount. Uh, tomatoes, of course, continue to top the list, not only in Canada, but internationally as the number one food producing item that people will grow in their garden or in a pot. People love their tomatoes. Uh, it's amazing how many people out there will tweet me, will email me, will Instagram me pictures of their tomatoes and say, what the heck is this? And nine times out of 10, if it's mid to late summer, it's blossom and rot, calcium deficiency. We can go through and we can talk a little bit more. Well, the new gardener, the new gardener in 2020 or the evolving gardener in 2020 is not only a millennial, it's the Gen Z or Gen Z because we are of course here in Canada. If you take a look, the UK's Royal uh, Horticultural Society, the RHS, saw a 533% increase in the number of 18 to 25 year olds visiting their website. And that's just in the last five months. That was from October, of course, that this article went out. And Vasey, Vasey Seeds, uh, you know, an institution when it comes to Canadian gardening, uh, they saw an incredible year with the amount of people that were ordering online. And also those that were just going on their website. And those going on their websites were between the ages of 25 and 35, 34 years of age. It's neat, even being at the garden center during the pandemic and even this last week being at the garden center, uh, who I'm seeing walking into the stores is all ages. And a lot of the times when they're walking into the store, where are they going? Well, I'll tell you nine times out of 10, if they're between the ages of 25 and 34, the first area that they're gonna go into is into indoor tropical plants. They'll look for Monstera, they'll look for ZZ plants, they'll look for Zamifolia, they'll look for Anthuriums, they'll look for interesting uh, Raven. Raven was one of the biggest sailors this year in terms of the Zamifolia that was in black. So the reason being, you'll hear this new phrase which has been called plant parenthood where now they're looking for something to care for, they're looking for something to make them feel good, but they're also doing the research out there to know that plants 
benefit us by having them indoors. They give the release of serotonin, and with that, they actually make you feel happier. The whole happiness industry outside of the world of gardening is one that's unbelievable. You'll hear the 5 a.m. club, which is a book by Robin Sharma, you know, the Tony Robbins, all those people are trying to find ways to make them happier. And by trying to do that overall, what we're seeing as well is that plants make people happy and plants make millennials very happy. But now it's unbelievable. If you go to Reddit, the amount of people that are selling plants on Reddit, Facebook marketplace, Kijiji, they're selling cuttings for 20 and $30. Well, plants, indoor plants are growing the one area that is losing is the perception on lawns. On platforms like Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, young people are sharing things about the anti-lawn. Almost that they're saying is that lawns are bad overall. And really, are they bad? A lot of this is over not misinformed public knowledge in terms that the lawn is really your, your lowest maintenance uh, item that you can have on a larger property that produces oxygen and that does provide a benefit overall if it's maintained and take care of and taken care of right. But you can see here that, you know, their thought is that it lacks biodiversity, that it's actually hard on the environment overall, but a lawn will beat pavement anytime and synthetic lawns still are growing in many areas overall. So what are people looking now? Well, they're looking for sustainability. And when we look at trends, and you know, we're talking about trends, Mark and Ben, in terms of gardening overall, one of the biggest trends that you should look at is how it's impact impacting gardening is how it's impacting food. And we've seen the organic movement in terms of food. And we've seen that that category in terms of the grocery store has grown year over year, and as well as the growing of sustainable food measures, even in the greenhouse industry. And my family, outside of having two garden centers, we do grow and supply uh, places like Loblaws, Sobeys, Canadian Tire. But with the use of neonics, uh, what we found is that many mer mass merchants and retailers now uh, really don't want that. And they want to know that the plant material overall is grown sustainably. So in greenhouse growing facilities now, what's happened is the use of bio bugs and the really we become better growers out of that. And the reason why we become better growers is that consumers have demanded that. And by demanding that they've changed our practices overall. So back to a little bit about why people garden and the new gardener that's out there. Well, the, as I mentioned, it's not only to feel happy, but it's a physical outdoor leisure activity that benefits community, benefits environment, and benefits you individually overall. I say it's like going to the gym and the beach in one. You get a physical workout, but at the same time you get some beautiful outdoor environment and you feel good and you improve. If you have a great garden, your house sells for more. If you have a good food growing garden, your friends really, you can share, you can share. And sometimes even if you just grow your own herbs, people think you're a good cook, even when you're not. So. How does fertilizer play in all of this? So we know that there's a younger gardener out there. We know that it's a, the younger gardener that's out there is somebody that wants to feel good, not only about themselves, but about their community. And they'll talk about social responsibility. They'll talk, talk about a good corporate citizen. And then we look at fertilizer. And fertilizer, if we look at it by definition, the Encyclopedia Britannica, fertilizer is a natural or artificial substance containing the chemical elements that improve growth and productiveness of a plant. Fertilizers enhance the natural fertility of the soil and replace the chemical elements taken from the soil by previous crops. That doesn't sound too bad, but often the perception of fertilizer is that it's a synthetic material that is taking advantage of the soil that has the threat of leaking phosphorus and other items back into the water table. So the question is with fertilizer, how are we going to educate this new gardener and make them more aware about how fertilizers can be used in a responsible and sustainable manner to benefit the productiveness of their plants and make them better gardeners and make them feel good about growing? Well, there's those buzzwords that are out there, natural, sustainable, organic, eco, environmental, green, socially responsible. Fertilizer though, in its simplicity, in its simplicity is food for plants. And the responsible use of fertilizers helps the plants and helps soil. So what I think is that what we have to do is create a little bit more of a campaign awareness in the terms of fertilizer and how it's used. And really, instead of using the word fertilizer, we call it plant food. And I know that many um, consumer packaging uh, now in terms of the consumer packaging of fertilizers has gone towards the use of the word plant food. And I think it's a great way to describe it because 
Many people get confused over nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They get, get confused and really not everybody wants to be that scientist, but what they want to be, you know, Ben and, and Mark, you're saying that, you know, people want to be gardeners. I think what the coolest word right now is not gardeners, it's growers. They want to be, they want to be known that I'm a grower. I grew that. I made that. That bouquet, I grew, I cut it, I harvested it, or I know the person who grew that. So we got to think about sustainable practices and what you're doing in your industry. It's great that you're doing it, but if you're doing it in the Canadian fertilizer industry and you're not promoting what you're doing or not educating why you're doing it, and this is not only from horticulture, but from an agricultural perspective, if nobody knows about it, there's no benefit overall. And I think that you can do a better job as an industry at doing that. So the solution in my eyes is that I think that fertilizer needs an improved image. I think that uh, it needs to have a new identity and that fertilizer um, basically needs to do a better job at promoting itself overall in terms of why it's good and why it's needed. And you got to remind yourself that even though today's gardener is younger, they're also more educated. So the information has to be correct information, but also they're information hungry. People out there right now are searching for information on day in and day out. It's amazing when I even go to the garden center right now and I see a person look at a plant tag. And as soon as they look at that plant tag, they pull out their phone, they go onto Google. They can either look at the information about that plant. They even have the tag in front of them. Or what they'll even do is they'll look at reviews on that plant on Reddit and whatnot on how it grew for other people and will it grow for them. Even though they have experts right in that garden center, they'd rather go to Reddit or to Google or even to look at their friends on Facebook to see who grew it and who grew it back. So that's just my quick little presentation that's there overall. I'm just gonna pop out of my share screen here and see if what I'm doing is right. Sorry about that, I'm getting used to all this overall. Uh, and uh, that's about it. So did I stop sharing my screen? I don't know. Sorry about that guys. Suzanne, are you there? Yes, I am, Frankie. We're, we, okay. um, if you had more slides, we're not seeing them, but uh, we do. No, see that them. was the last. That was the last slide overall. Okay. okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Frankie. Um, I mean, again, I'll just remind everyone if you have any questions, um, even if they are your specific growing questions or experiences you've had over uh, this period of uh, COVID, um, you know, isolation to different uh, extents. There are a few things that I just wanted to make note of in uh, Frankie's uh, presentation. First of all, uh, he was talking about his dog Bentley and, uh, and also the popularity of tomatoes. Um, we were talking about blossom and rot. And the other thing that we found out, we were also growing tomatoes this summer is that you also have to keep an eye on your dog because uh, our dog found, and he was very particular, he would go through the tomatoes and uh, check out the ones that he thought were most appealing. And uh, we found that he was actually consuming a significant amount of our, our, uh, our uh, deck side uh, crop of tomatoes this year. So just another little gardening tip to those of you that um, may be going into the, uh, the tomato growing um, business. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that I think that was an important point that Frankie made with regards to fertilizer and the image of fertilizer. And again, it's, uh, you know, fertilizer is plant food and it, uh, regardless of the source, it is providing us with the nutrients and the plant, uh, the food that plants need for uh, successful growth. And uh, again, we go back to that, uh, you know, how do we communicate and what do we communicate to each other in uh, common interest with regards to uh, sustainability um, in both a, a local and also a global sense. Um, so anyway, I just want to leave with those thoughts. And uh, I don't see that we have any more questions at this point. Um, so I thought perhaps we would move on, unless you have something else to say, Frankie, uh, we would move on to uh, Kelly Lee Bertrell. No, thanks for the opportunity today, guys. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Frank. And sorry, that's uh, Carrie Lee Birchill. Uh, Carrie Lee Birchill is from the Canada Agriculture and Food, Mus Food Museum in Ottawa. And again, this is another opportunity. And, and Carrie is going to talk to us about, uh, you know, those opportunities for us to learn a little bit more and how do we reach out to Canadians and uh, provide them with the information and uh, um, address, uh, you know, our common interest in, in agriculture and in food. Uh, Carrie Lee has devoted the last 25 years of her professional life to the National Museums of Science and Innovation and is, a pr and is proud to serve as an executive with 
the in Ingenium, Ingenium, Ingenium Canada. In addition, she is currently serving as the Secretary General for the International Association of Agricultural Museums. Carrie Lee has a degree in social science from the University of Ottawa and continues to cultivate collaborative opportunities for cultural celebrations, heritage preservation, and partnerships, which increase understanding about food security and sustainable development goals. Terry Lee will be giving us a presentation on soil superheroes, a combination of traveling, a traveling exhibition, learning modules, and online resources that will be uh, that will present soil as a dynamic team of superheroes whose powers make life on Earth possible. And I'll pass it over to you, Carrie. Thank you so much, yes. Suzanne. And thank you to the organizers of the Canadian Fertilizer Products Forum uh, and the other presenters today. I'd like to just very quickly start uh, by saying that I am presenting from the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum in Ottawa this morning. Um, and that I'd like to acknowledge that the museum is located on the traditional and unceded um, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And so I will just very quickly start sharing my screen. And I will. There we go. So uh, thank you very much. And I, I realize that uh, we are on a, on a tight time limit today. So I will go through my presentation fairly quickly, um, but please do know uh, if ever you have any questions or if you would like any of this content en français, n'hésitez pas de communiquer avec notre équipe ici au musée. I'm happy to share any of the information in English or French um, that I'll be going through in the slides. So just very, very quickly, the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum is part of the Ingenium family of science and innovation museums. As such, we do differ a little bit from some of those international colleagues um, on the International Association of Agricultural Museums and that we are looking at agriculture through the lens of STEAM. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. And certainly when it comes to the arts, we're talking about the humanities and some of the social and ethical impacts of agriculture uh, in our society. We are very happy to welcome under normal circumstances over 200,000 visitors a year. Uh, and we're very, very proud to serve our national audiences through traveling exhibitions and educational programs. Uh, along with our partners, um, we're able to reach and share that knowledge with millions of Canadians and international uh, audiences every year. So the powerful idea, Ben and Mark um, mentioned earlier an education gap in terms of public understanding of fertilizer and soil. And so we're really excited uh, that we have a new traveling exhibition coming up along with a lot of educational programs and learning modules that are going to take a look at um, really that gap in understanding that soil is a finite resource, even though it seems to be everywhere. Uh, when we've done some of our early testing, we realize that um, there are a lot of, um, you know, our, our neighbors that are not realizing that soil is a finite in, uh, resource and that it is something that our quality of life is intrinsically linked to. So uh, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, some of our renewable energy sources, certainly some of our medicines are directly linked um, to soil and soil health. And so we are looking forward through this exhibition and our programming to helping uh, raise awareness and understanding and hopefully be a catalyst for curiosity when it comes to soil health. Uh, why is the museum doing that and, and why now? Um, it's very timely. Uh, the museum is quite committed to working uh, with our partners at uh, unpacking some of the um, topics that are found in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we certainly are aware that there's a, a, an interest right now in an international decade of, of soils, uh, that we're currently in the International Year of Plant Health and that next year will be the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables as declared by the United Nations FAO. Um, and we do feel that it is one of those common denominators uh, when it comes to our production of uh, food security uh, in Canada in a global perspective. So the big idea um, for this exhibition and the programming that we are really proud to be working on um, is that human life does depend on the uh, balanced interactions between the different components that make up soil. And that soil is in fact, um, we're, we're proposing and, and, and from an interpretation perspective, we're really excited about this concept of presenting soil as a team of superheroes that work together and, and that they um, in tandem support humanity. 
Um, certainly when um, Frankie was discussing um, that, that, I, that concept of image and, and um, how the public perhaps perceives a fertilizer, fertilizers, I believe that, th that the understanding of the four R's of the nutrient cycle, so having um, the right component at the right time um, is going to be really critical when we look at food security in Canada and around the world uh, coming up. So the key message in our upcoming traveling exhibition will be why uh, healthy soil is important and that soil as an ecosystem has to be in balance and that as humans that depend on agriculture for a lot of the products, as I said, that, that we rely on for our quality of life, that it does have an impact um, on our environment from a climate action perspective. Um, we are happy in this exhibition to delve into that aspect of agriculture. This is in no way villainizing any one industry. Um, what we're doing is putting together a very proactive and inspiring perspective of the interactions between humans and soil um, and how we can be uh, soil superheroes as well. So that audience engagement is going to be very important. Um, there are definitely will be opportunities in the traveling exhibition uh, for our audiences of, of every age, whether, whether they be very young school students, whether they be adults or just uh, concerned um, citizens that they can see their role in um, supporting soil health. Um, we definitely also as, an, as a National Museum, um, along with our partners, realize that there will be a need um, for those future generations to um, help develop some of those career profiles, uh, skills development um, for our up and coming generations to see their role um, in everything from being a soil scientist to researchers to entrepreneurs to how we transport our goods all has a role um, in soil health. And so we're really looking forward to um, putting this together. We currently have uh, nine educational programs that directly link back to soil and soil health. Uh, and I'm happy to share links um, to the, the free resources that are already available on our website. And we're really looking forward um, with the discovery cart in the new exhibition um, of including a lot more content that any venue could use and unpack um, some of these issues. So the Exhibition itself, if you're in a community that you think might be interested, will be coming online. It will be opening here at the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum on Canada Day next year. And then it will be going on a national tour um, across Canada or throughout Canada. Um, we are intentionally putting this together uh, so that it can fit any venue, any community, anything from a museum to a children's uh, science center to um, a cultural event, a, a hospital, a conference. It's really meant to be uh, very, very easy for communities to open and then have some of those discussions and conversations and engagements with the public through the, so the discovery cart. Uh, so just very quickly uh, to let everyone know, we're, we're thrilled that this will be opening here in Ottawa in 2021. It will stay here for a year, uh, along with some of the artifacts and some uh, education program testing. And then it will be going on the road for at least three years. Um, and that we are looking at developing more content with partners in tandem with some of our national partners and with, with provincial uh, guidelines for curriculum. That said, it's not only about uh, children and, and youth, it's also about putting together uh, guest speakers, webinars, uh, making sure that we are playing part of that advocacy role um, in making sure as consumers that we are educated and that we are um, making decisions moving forward based on the contemporary research um, and science and best practice that's out there. So I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank our partners to date uh, for their help with putting together uh, the traveling exhibition and the programming. And I think that's my time. So I will stop sharing my screen um, and I'm happy to answer questions or share uh, more information. Um, certainly I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Ben and Mark and Frank when, when I say that I think it is uh, beholden to all of us to play a proactive role in discussing soil health, fertilizers, um, and certainly uh, food production and gardening in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Carolee. Um, short but sweet, and um, I think I uh, had some important messages there. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, the as Carolee really was saying that they, they um, it will be going live next uh, summer during uh, at on July 1st, 
but um, the opportunities here for those that are on the uh, website of the participants is that um, this is a Canada initiative and um, you know, they're the obvious target audiences that we'll be looking at or could could benefit from this. But I think that, you know, if you have organizations that you're involved in it, you wouldn't necessarily think, you know, that a garden or uh, importance or soil heroes presentation may fit into um, their uh, agenda or mandate. But it's important that this message get out to all Canadians. And if you see an opportunity here, I'm sure that the interest is there in other organizations and bring the message about sustainability and, uh, and food security to all Canadians um, and this exhibition and the information here, I think is suitable to so many audiences. Um, uh, we'll go for some, we have a few questions from uh, the participants and um, then we will um, we all have some wrap up. If anyone has any more comments, um, they can interject them there or interrupt me. Um, we have a question again from uh, Clyde. Do these trends, and this would be to everyone, do these trends create an opportunity to have a better dialogue? I think there's something that we can um, hear from all, all four of our participants. Do these trends create an opportunity to have a better dialogue with consumers and gardeners about fertilizer and agriculture? I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, maybe I'll uh, start off with that. Yes, indeed. Uh, there's there's never been a greater interest uh, and and thirst for knowledge when it comes to growing. I'll, I'll give you an example. My, my camera person this morning that I worked with on Breakfast Television, his name is Miradad. Uh, Miradad is 35 years age, a new father of two, and uh, every time he's in the greenhouse with me, he is full of questions. He really wants to know how to grow, how to grow better, and in terms of that, he's also asking how to feed, and, and why should he feed, and what should he feed with. So um, if the content is put out there and it's put out there well, the knowledge is there, and so yes, the, the conversation can increase because people want to have the conversation, so there's no better time. If it's okay, I'll, I'll, I will jump in uh, and, and I agree 100% uh, with the museum's programming. Um, we've been putting together food for thought um, discussions, certainly as we're having audiences come through um, as recently as, as on uh, World Fertilizer Day um, with really, um, uh, you know, genuine concern, genuine curiosity when it comes to, um, you know, what is the best means of um, supporting their soil health, whether it be in their garden or in their community. Um, when is the right time to apply different types of fertilizer? So I think we all have a role to play in making sure that we are presenting, um, you know, the most recent research and making sure that we can answer those questions to help support them um, as we're looking at um, producing, uh, you know, a, a balance of um, store-bought food and, and what we can produce um, ourselves, um, depending on where you live in Canada, um, I think that will be really important that we're all um, mindful and playing a role in, in soil health. I, I mean, I, again, I couldn't agree more that there's more interest probably than ever. And I would think as a, it is an industry group, the only thing I would perhaps mention is, I think it's important to really respect people's concerns and I think um, people are genuinely concerned about the environment. They're concerned about climate change. I think to be authentic and honest uh, in the presentation of facts is really important. Otherwise, um, lest it come off maybe too much like a sales pitch because there's so much competing, call it authentic streams of information. Um, you don't want to discredit yourself either. I think, um... I, I think the greatest challenge after the five of us, uh, or maybe the 85 of us that are viewing the today have digested the information is how do you boil it down? <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you boil it down into language that the consumer understands? And how do you engage the consumer? And this is a question that Ben and Frank and I, and probably Carrie Lee as well, uh, live with every day. You, you've got to figure that out. You've got to figure that out. If you want to communicate effectively, you have to figure it out. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think this question, um, the next question is um, uh, directed at uh, Carrie Lee and um, uh, the Canadian Agricultural Food Museum. Uh, can you share how this nationally traveling soil initiative is part of a successful history of other topics that are currently traveling across Canada that is of great interest to both Canadians and to the industry sectors. 
Hmm. Uh, interesting question. So uh, we do have multiple traveling exhibitions um, out on the road, um, even through COVID. Um, they are in communities um, and, and hopefully all of them are creating opportunities to have discussion on what could be uh, controversial topics, but certainly key issues of our time. Uh, so everything from uh, food literacy um, to uh, you know other STEM related um, topics, what we are hoping with our partners is that this can go to a community that it does support it, it opens that that um, room for dialogue. Um, and we are looking at um, the history as snapshots in time. Um, certainly, no one would have intended to have created, for example, a dust bowl um, in, in the just, well, you know, not so distant history that that was a result of um, the technology and science and awareness at the time. And I think that's really important for all of us to remember that uh, in agriculture and certainly in uh, STEM research, that, that there is that ongoing evolution of understanding and awareness and best practice. And I think we are at a tipping point right now uh, in Canada and around the world um, for better understanding our need for agriculture and how that impacts the environment and how we can do a better uh, job of trying to make sure that it is sustainable and balanced. Um, agriculture by its very definition is an intervention in, in nature. However, I think there are certainly ways and we're seeing, um, we're starting to see the results of, of having better technology, better research, um, better awareness and education applied to agriculture, uh, not just in Canada, but, but hopefully around the world as well. Thank you, Carolee. Um, another question, are there opportunities for further sponsorship? And I think this is also for Carrie Lee with regards to the uh, sponsors that you included on one of your slides. Yes, I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely there is. Uh, we are really happy with the, the partners that have stepped up so far uh, with funding, but also with uh, you know, a very generous sharing of their expertise, um, of some of their, their research and resources. Uh, we are always looking um, for more sponsors and partners. Um, with more help, we can make sure that this gets to more communities and we can certainly layer on uh, year over year onto the educational programming. Um, and that, that's done in tandem with other educational partners throughout Canada. Uh, and hopefully, um, now that we are seeing this trend through gardening, um, and at this resurgence of, of um, a lot of people wanting to produce their own food and products, um, that it, it's becoming more and more relevant um, to every single Canadian. Thank you. And I guess along those lines is um, have these programs created partnerships or interests from recognized sustainability NGOs. I, I'm, I, absolutely. Um, so certainly when it, it comes to uh, working with um, environmental groups, when we're looking at climate action, and, and that's that pro proactive aspect to um, recognizing and, and encouraging um, everyone to take that proactive role as an educated consumer or as you're deciding on what career you're going to go into. Um, NGOs, uh, certainly some of, as I said, some of the other national um, educators and groups uh, so industry, academia, government, and non-government organizations across Canada um, have partnered and, and are certainly helping contribute to the base of knowledge that we are putting forward um, in, this, in this exhibition and in the programming. Um, we definitely want to make sure that it's a balanced perspective. Um, this is not a, a, a not a simple topic, um, you know, as, as um, a species on this planet that definitely does have an impact on other species and on the environment itself. Uh, we, we want to play that proactive role um, in educating. And I think uh, Ben and Mark and, and Frank were speaking to that uh, with the kind of questions that are coming up from, from gardeners um, and from people wanting to produce and, and be better stewards of the land. It, it's, it's about farmers, but it's about all of us as consumers and also as growers. I think we, we touched on the next uh, topic here a little bit, but um, I think that maybe some expansion is, is being asked for. And what's your opinion on lawns? Do you think it's going to become mainstream to replace lawns with garden for food? Who's going to leave? <laughs> if you <laughs> want, I have a thought on this. Yeah, I, I want to, I, I'll give a little bit of a kind of a little bit of background as well. Um, so it's amazing how lawns have transitioned. Uh, about, I would say, eight years ago, everybody would want information on how to get rid of dandelions. And now if you write an article about getting rid of dandelions, the backlash that you get about uh, how people want dandelions and how they want them for the production of bees and to help bees in the, as an early flower source. So 
will lawns be replaced? I think in some areas, I don't think everybody will replace the lawn. Uh, if you live on an acreage property and you don't have a lot of time, your lawn is probably your most environmentally friendly, lowest maintenance uh, thing that you can put out there. And I think you'll find some people that are going to build a big two acre garden and realize how much work it's going to be thereafter as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of interesting where we went from the victory garden where people had to focus more on ornamentals and flowers. And now we're going back to that victory garden again. So we'll see how that cycle goes overall. But I think people want sustainable lawns. They want lawns that uh, are green and lawns that even the lawn right now that I see very popular is a lawn with clover and grass as well. So a mixed lawn that has a little bit of everything, a little diverse lawn. Mark or Ben or Carolee, do you have anything to add to that? Um I think I think the the answer is lawns lawns. Uh, sorry, I have something stuck stuck in my throat. Ben, you go. I I mean I, I don't think they're going away entirely because they're so useful. They still make the best ground cover where there's medium traffic and they're low maintenance uh, and they're attractive to look at. I don't think they're going away entirely. Um, I think sometimes it's a false dichotomy to say, well, you know, if the alternative is synthetic or asphalt, when people are asking about lawns, they're not saying. I'm going to pave my backyard. You know, I think there are there is an honest curiosity about what is the sustainable alternative, and um, I think if we're talking about increasing the tree canopy in the urban environment, well, lawns is a perfect place to start, right? And uh, that kind of mid growth native shrubs too, right? The, the biological carrying capacity. So, you know, um, will they go away entirely? Likely not. Will we see more food production? Hopefully, but. To Frankie's point, people underestimate how much work some of this stuff is. So uh, I see, you know, some of it being rewilded per sort of the Doug Tallamy mandate um, as well, especially in urban spaces where we need to plant more trees. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, both these guys make great points. Um, you know, Frankie, you remind me of the milkweed story. 10 years ago, we were demonizing the milkweed. Now everybody wants to grow milkweed. You find seeds on seed racks for milkweed. Um, so a similar story there. And I, I don't think we're going to see people replacing their lawn so much as reducing their lawn spaces. So let's carve a little bit of lawn out so we can grow some, some tomatoes in some raised beds, for instance. And how we approach the lawn, how we approach the maintenance of a lawn, and our expectations of that lawn, uh, i.e. the perfection we wanted a generation ago, that's good, that's going. It, it, anybody under 50, it's gone, if it was ever there. We don't want perfection anymore. We want a lawn to function like a lawn naturally does, which is pretty ugly in July, when you have the kind of July we just had, hot and dry. Let it go brown, let it go dormant. Most people are okay with that now. I would uh, agree. We, we have questions quite often uh, from visitors here um, on the experimental farm about uh, the, the lawn and, and the grass that is grown. Um, certainly we're, we're on um, a research facility that's looking at, at cereal and oil seeds. So sometimes there's also confusion about uh, crop cover and some of the um, research that's going on um, and how that gets blended into uh, different types of grasses. Um, but it, it, it is absolutely, I agree, I, I think it was Ben that was saying there, there, there are more and more community resources uh, where, um, you know, people are being encouraged and if you cannot take care of the garden yourself that there are others that will come uh, and help um, with that space and make sure that that is repurposed to a food bank or another um, public community service. So we are certainly um, looking at, at developing more of those partnerships here. And I think it is something that is, is in response to our audience and, and consumer trend of, of wanting to know what's, what's that right proportion. Okay, thank you all. Um, the next question is from George Lazarevitz. Uh, the trend in high production agriculture is to get out of soil and into substrates like peat moss, coco coir, hydroponics, et cetera. The growth in industry is exponential. What are your thoughts on this trend? Well, if I can chime in here, only because I think we're talking about something that's distinct from the consumer trend, and um, that can happen within agriculture. And I think that that's there's very good reasons for that, right? Um, biosecurity, efficiency, 
consistent production quality, you name it, costs. And that's, that's great. I think where the industry then has to protect itself or be mindful is that even if the agricultural production methods happen, kind of are invisible to the consumer, the consumer is still ultimately driving all these trends. So while the direct consumer trend might move away from peat first, who knows, a decade from now, they could be looking to agriculture and saying, well, what are our producers using the way that they've kind of put that level of scrutiny against other agricultural production methods? Um, but I, it is distinct for the time being. And I think there's, there's good reasons they're, they're, they're effective products. From the museum, uh, I would just add that, um, you know, Canada is a vast country and, and quite often uh, people uh, perhaps aren't, aren't aware that only about 5% of, of the uh, terrain is suitable for, for crop production. So um, it does make sense to be looking at other types of uh, growing mediums, um, certainly with technology, you know, Canada is a leader when it comes to some of the greenhouse technology. Certainly when we're looking at some of our remote communities, uh, they will not have access to the same uh, type of soil resources that we do in in southern climates here in Canada. Um, so I think it is uh, it's it's not it's a trend for good reason. It is looking at other viable options um, and and trying to make sure that where there is uh, you know that where there are soil health or so or a lack of soil health, um, what are the ways that people can have food security and food sovereignty in their in their community? It, it's it's a very important issue. Yeah, if you look online, just add to that, if you look online uh, and even globally, the amount of vertical farms that are happening right now in uh, old, um, even factory spaces, how they're utilized for the food production, the use of roof spaces in some urban centers. So you're cutting down on the impact to the environment in terms of travel costs overall. But there will always be a place that people will want soil and sun. So there will always be a place where people want something that's grown from the soil and the sun that's overall. But there's some areas of our country and some areas globally, but it's just not possible because the soil's not there, the sun's not there. And so they have to look for alternative growing uh, methods that are efficient and produce good food at a good price with a very low impact in terms of travel. Okay, and we have a, a final question here is how does soil fit into UNESCO's sustainable development goals? And Carol Lee, maybe we'll start with you and then if anyone else wants to uh, join in. Uh, so um, part that is a big part of the reason why uh, we wanted to, to delve in. We, we did feel that it was a common denominator on, on quite a few. Um, so for those that are familiar uh, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17. Um, we see very, very direct links with at least four. So um, responsible consumption and production, um, sustainable communities, uh, life on land and climate action. Um, soil absolutely plays a role in um, nutrient cycling, in carbon sequestration. Um, and then there's also the other benefits ab above and beyond the soil itself. And, and that has to deal with um, reducing hunger, um, with making sure from an industry perspective and an infrastructure perspective that, that a country or a community can sustain itself. Um, so we, we definitely feel that, um, you know, the opportunity to speak about it today and, and with audiences throughout Canada is going to be really important. It, it definitely, when you're looking ahead at 2030 and changes that we all need to make uh, here in Canada and, and around the world, um, that how we, uh, you know, our respect for soil um, and, and the fertilizers and all of the different components that support it, um, it, it has to factor into our, our higher discussions about food security. Um, thanks, Carolee. Um, and just uh, just on the light of that, because we've had a mix of questions here, I mean, primarily focused on the, the consumer, but we do see that connection with agriculture. And I just want to encourage people who have taken part or perhaps didn't get a chance to take part in some of the previous uh, webinars that we've provided is take a look back at some of the discussion there. We had a specific session on soil health and um, there's uh, some you know, this perspective of how do you look at this from an agricultural sustainability standpoint, how do you look at this in the perspective of the consumer, I think is an, it would be an interesting analysis for someone who wants to look at that whole, um, the whole package, so to speak. I, th I, th I think the term to look out for here is regenerative ag. I'm, you know, I run an organic food business. I'm on the Organic Council in Ontario here, and that's, that's the one that's on our radar, which is very outcomes-based, measuring soil health year over year. Mm -hmm. uh, the term regenerative is, I think, what we're going to see a lot more of on the consumer side. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, we definitely have a lot of uh, requests for, for more information and, and programming on uh, regenerative agriculture and circular economies. So that idea of reducing food waste. So um, making sure that all, all of the products uh, that we're producing are being used, um, you know, reducing inputs wherever possible, increasing outputs for, for healthy communities. I agree with Ben. Good. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers, uh, Carolee, Frank, uh, Ben, and Mark. Uh, I think that they've given us um, some interesting perspectives and I think a lot of interesting opportunities for us to all go out and, and learn a little bit more about sustainability um, and, uh, and how, you know, how, how COVID, the COVID uh, factor in this, and as well as where are we going to be in 10 years, which was, of course, the focus of, of, uh, of this uh, session. Um, I want to thank you all for participating today and, uh, uh, and thank you to our participants. Um, we also want to thank uh, Kevin Jack from WeStream who has um, provided the technical support today and uh, it has been vital <laughs> and very much appreciated by those of us who participated uh, as uh, panelists or moderators during the last sessions. Um, I want to thank everyone who has participated in any one of the Canadian Fertilizer Products Forum sessions. Uh, for more information on uh, Fertilizer Canada or um, Fertilizer Supplement Advisory Committee, um, suggest that you go to their websites. I think they've been presented in um, this and other um, webinars, uh, so you can contact them. Uh, I, I did want to talk about also to thank uh, Canadian Fru Food Inspection Agency. And uh, just go back and, you know, we were talking about the fact that this is the 14th annual CFPF um, forum that we have uh, had. And this was all part of a uh, brainchild of and a collaboration between CFIA and uh, initially Fertilizer Canada and more recently um, FSAP or our Fertilizer Supplements Advisory Committee has joined as well um, into supporting these efforts. But this has been a collaborative effort and I think we need to hear um, you know, first of all, it's important for the industry to present their concerns to the government. But the other important factor here or contrib contribution is that we have a CFIA that is actually there listening to what we, what we say and working with us in working groups and providing us with questions and uh, issues that they would like to have feedback on. And we certainly appreciate that this collaboration has gone on um, successfully for 14 years. And then the other thing I just want to say to those who are participating is that uh, it is important, it is, uh, we've talked a lot about trends uh, during these sessions, but it's important to hear from the industry. And if you haven't looked at how you could support our um, uh, both either Fertilizer Canada or FSAC, you may wanna look at their websites. If there are issues here that you think are important to the industry that haven't been raised, this is an important or an opportunity for you to look at their websites and even better have a conversation about them, about how um, your needs could be met, uh, met uh, with regards to new uh, business opportunities. And also how can you support um, these organizations uh, that are there to represent you and advocate for you and provide the, the opportunities and the resources to communicate with the government. Um, so that we can uh, have not only a, just a successful economy at the agricultural level, but also serve the consumers as well. Thanks very much to everybody. And I think this has been an informative session and um, have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks, it's been a pleasure. Dad, everybody else. <laughs>